everyone, today's video is on perioperative medication management. Now, this is maybe not the most exciting topic or even the most uh, surgically interesting topic, but it is a very important topic that um, can have a great deal to do with your patient's outcomes and is definitely worth reviewing. Now, again, these videos are for educational purposes only and for actual clinical advice, I always recommend consulting your own institutional guidelines for perioperative medication management but especially when patients are in the inpatient setting, getting acutely admitted for urgent or emergent operations, uh, it can be difficult to wrangle through all that information. You know, dozens of pages of single spaced, tightly packed charts uh, that are difficult to go through and interpret. So I thought it would be helpful to do a bit of an overview of some of the most common and the most important medications uh, and how we think about handling them in the perioperative period based on the current available evidence. Again, in addition to your own institutional guidelines that I recommend looking at, uh, there's also some resources that I heavily used while making this talk, such as the ACC AHA 2014 guidelines on uh, perioperative medications, as well as the American College of Surgeons guidelines for the perioperative management of antithrombotic medications in 2018. Uh, we'll have links to both of those uh, in the notes. Anyway, without further ado. Uh, so the first medication uh, that we're going to talk about is aspirin. Um, this is one of the more controversial medications, but also a very important one. Uh, from the data I could find, again, mostly related to the AHA, uh, it really hinges on the question of, is the patient taking aspirin for cardiac stents or not? If they are taking it for stents, typically it's best to continue. And if not, it's really about a risk benefit discussion between the cardiologists and the surgeons. Um, for me also, it depends a bit on whether it's the baby aspirin dose, 81, which I'm very, very likely to continue in most perioperative settings, or the higher dose, 325, which might be a bit um, more concerning for some people. Realistically, if you're admitting a patient overnight, they would need to have held their aspirin for seven days to have an effect, so I'll often just continue it. And if it's a problematic issue in the OR, you can think about reversing it uh, with a platelet transfusion. But definitely something worth bumping up the chain if you're uh, admitting someone and you're not sure about this. All right, beta blockers. These ones have a more straightforward answer. If a patient is chronically on beta blockers, you want to continue them. Um, this is very clearly stated in the 2014 AHA guidelines. This is class one evidence uh, that continuing previously or chronically taken beta blockers uh, provides a mortality benefit and prevents um, MIs. In general surgery, of course, sometimes oral regimens aren't going to work, so these might have to be converted to an IV regimen, such as IV metoprolol, for example. Statins, another pretty straightforward one. Um, while a lot of times it seems like, oh, just some medication to take as an outpatient, why not just hold it? There's actually good data, and again, this is class one AHA guidelines that you should continue statins in the perioperative period for those that are previously taken them. Um, large uh, not necessarily randomized trials, but retrospective and prospectively matched trials have shown a significant mortality benefit with a number needed to treat of only 85, which is really not that many when you think about it. So this is one that I often see missed and I'm always uh, restarting when I see my junior residents holding it overnight. So statins are actually generally continued in the perioperative period. All right, next up, anticoagulation, blood thinners, um, et cetera. So obviously, we very rarely, if ever, like to operate on anticoagulation. So you should be thinking about or planning to hold this in your preoperative patients you're admitting overnight. However, um, it, I want you to go a little bit beyond that. In addition to holding this, you need to answer two very important questions about the anticoagulation for any patient you're admitting for surgery. So one, you need to know what's the indication for the anticoagulation. Some indications are very amenable to short-term holding. For example, atrial fibrillation, there is a stroke risk over time, um, but the acute short risk over a few days is actually very low. But other indications um, are much more severe. For example, something like uh, mechanical mitral valve, you really want to think carefully before you stop that anticoagulation. And number two, you need to know the last dose. That will tell you if you can just even if you've held the, medica the medication overnight, if they haven't held it for, you know, two or three days, you might still have to think about reversing the agent, which I guess should be a third thing that you should know or at least be thinking about overnight. 
So if your patient comes in on anticoagulation, one, hold the anticoagulation. Two, make sure you figure it out. Usually the easiest is just asking the patient and reviewing their medical record what the indication is, when they took their last dose. Then three, start thinking about reversal, which you may or may not need to start overnight. So some common agents and their reversal strategies. Uh, warfarin has the most options. So if we're just talking about warfarin, you can reverse uh, relatively slowly with vitamin K. You can also reverse more quickly with some volume with FFP, fresh frozen plasma. And then finally, if you don't want to give the volume associated with FFP, you can do PCC or prothrombin complex concentrates. Again, these are all for your options for warfarin. A lot of patients nowadays are on the DOAX, direct oral anticoagulants, DOAX. For these, um, you used to not have many options. Now we've got at least two directed monoclonal antibodies to the DOAX that you should be thinking about. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce them, but one's something like Andexanet and the other one is related to Dibigatran. Um, or another option even for those or for other DOAX is uh, PCC again, those prothrombin complex concentrates. And then finally, uh, when we think about antiplatelet agents, for example, like we talked about aspirin earlier or Plavix, Ticagrelor, et cetera, those um, unfortunately have a pretty long acting effect on our platelets. And th so those often need a platelet transfusion to reverse in the OR as needed. Again, another thing to think about, not only holding anticoagulation, but really focus on what's that indication. And then remember that in some cases, you may need to hold their anticoagulation, but actually bridge them in the perioperative period if they really need that anticoagulation for all times uh, outside of surgery. And that bridging would, of course, usually be done with the heparin drip, um, fractionated heparin. So those are all the things that I think should be running through your mind when you have a patient coming in on anticoagulation. All right, ACEs and ARBs, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. So this, we're now, um, again, have a pretty kind of straightforward answer here. Generally, you're going to hold these in the perioperative period. There's a risk of hypotension, perioperative hypotension, and uh, anesthesiologists in particular are quite worried about this. They're the ones monitoring, monitoring that and managing the perioperative hypotension in the operating room. And you will often get a case canceled if you admit a patient and put them on their ACE or ARB and they get it the morning of surgery. If you are worried about their hypertension, um, there are always IV PRNs that people can get, for example, IV labetalol or IV hydralazine. Um, and so if you're worried about their blood pressure related to the ACE and ARBs, that's usually a manageable situation. All right, another medication often used for blood pressure, diuretics. Um, these I also generally recommend holding, at least initially. Remember, your patients are going to be NPO for a pretty significant amount of time perioperatively. Um, there's also usually a bunch of fluid shifts. We talked about this in one of our previous videos where uh, surgery is a very pro-inflammatory event. Initially, that slowly goes down over time. And with that pro-inflammation, you get a lot of leakage of fluid uh, through the capillaries into the third spaces. And while that happens, you're definitely at risk of becoming fluid down, even if you're normally diuretic dependent at baseline. Um, certainly, there's patients where you want to restart this sooner rather than later. For example, heart failure patients, et cetera, people who aren't really going to tolerate any extra water well. Uh, but generally, again, holding diuretics because they are going to have less fluid intake can protect the kidneys a bit and just lead to a, a more uh, simple post-op course. All right. I know this is a bit like a laundry list, but hopefully you're getting some, some pearls out of each one. So anti-diabetic agents, again, there's a, at least for a surgery resident, a dizzying pharmacopoeia of anti-diabetic diabetic agents nowadays. Uh, but to knock it down, to keep it simple overnight, one, hold all oral medications. You don't want any oral um, hypoglycemic agents, including things like metformin. So hold all those. Um, and anytime I hold these oral meds, I just put somebody on a sliding scale insulin. So they're getting frequent glucose checks and they're getting insulin to correct any hyperglycemia. Um, on patients with long acting insulin, some institutional protocols will have you restart maybe a half or a third dose. Um, but that's kind of getting into the weeds. For me overnight, if I make the patient NPO, hold their oral meds and start a sliding scale, I feel like I've done pretty good at getting things started. 
the critical fail, of course, with anti-diabetic agents is critical hypoglycemia in patients that are not going to have oral intake because they're NPO for surgery. And the easiest way to do that is by giving them too much uh, long-acting or giving their oral meds when they're not needed. All right, almost there. Another important medication class is corticosteroids. Of course, um, a lack of corticosteroids leads to adrenal failure and, again, hypotension for adrenal failure. So corticosteroids are generally continued in the perioperative period. Of course, again, I'm a GI surgeon or surgeon in training, but anytime you're thinking about GI surgery, a lot of times people have to switch from their PO regimen to an IV regimen. If that's the case, I recommend just asking the appropriate service that prescribe the immunosuppression in the first place or the steroids in the first place, what dose they would like. Um, but often they're able to pretty simply switch to an IV regimen that you can maintain during surgery to prevent um, an acute drop in blood pressure during that stressful event when their HPA axis has probably been pharmacologically suppressed over time. All right, some quick hits to finish uh, that I didn't want to make their own slides for. These are some rare medications, but ones that should raise a red flag in, in your head when you see them. So there's a lot of medications that don't really matter. You kind of just click through, you're like, oh, I can ignore this, go, th go through to the morning. But these, at least in my head, are the ones that come to mind as like, oh, I really need to make special note to take care of this appropriately, um, or else the patient can again have some issues. So first is DAPT or dual antiplatelet therapy. This is just like when you have cardiac stents and you get two antiplatelet agents, I call that DAPT. Some people haven't heard of that before, but that's a pretty common terminology. So for example, aspirin and Plavix or aspirin and Ticagrelor would be examples of DAPT. And so for DAPT, just talk to cardiology, um, especially in the first 12 months after stent placement, it's really important that people get the appropriate DAPT therapy. So those are particularly high risk times and even more reason to talk to your uh, friendly neighborhood cardiologist. Um, antiarrhythmics are a similar issue. We talked about beta blockers already, which should be continued, uh, but you definitely want to have a plan for any antiarrhythmics perioperatively because you don't want your patients going into some sort of arrhythmia when they're trying to recover from their surgery, which would have obvious poor consequences. Again, antiepileptics, very important. Having a seizure is always bad for you, but especially in the postoperative period. Again, a uh, big thing to think about with various types of surgery is will they be able to maintain their home PO regimen? If not, then you need to consult neurology about getting an appropriate IV regimen on board prophylactically, because again, you want to keep these patients far away from having any sort of perioperative seizure as these are associated with bad outcomes. Anti-Parkinson's is one that can kind of slip by some people, but if you stop any of these medications, um, people can have acute Parkinsonian crises where they stop moving. It's very confusing um, and scary for them and for the medical team as they figure out what's going on. Uh, again, low threshold to consult neurology for help if you don't think they're going to be able to take these medications, which are generally oral. All right, cytotoxic chemotherapy. This is a terrible thing to operate on because they have generally very low blood counts. They're unable to fight off infections postoperatively. They're unable to heal appropriately, et cetera. So if your patient's on cytotoxic chemotherapy, you need to really think about, is an operation the right thing for this patient at all? And if you really think it is, you absolutely want to be in contact with their oncology team um, about, one, balancing the risk benefits of any sort of procedure, and two, uh, how to manage their medications in the perioperative setting. Finally, immunosuppression. This really depends on what the immunosuppression is for. Some uh, are much more uh, benign than others in terms of being able to hold for a time. So again, you want to find out why they have the immunosuppression and talk to the appropriate service about if it's appropriate to hold or if you they would prefer you to switch it um, to a, a different regimen for the perioperative period. All right, that's it. Again, very complex topic, a lot of data. Um, we'll link some resources for you to go deeper on this if you want to. Um, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Pharmacists are a great resource, et cetera. Um, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of guidance and saved you a little bit of time uh, the next time you're admitting that pre-op patient. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any disease, and we will see you next time.